Hello, welcome to this kind of impromptu little series. Uh, I thought it might be handy for some people to know how to create an area to populate with uh, a group of actors in uh, Unreal using blueprints. So what I thought I would do is just start with some simple um, static meshes and then show you how you can extend that to spawn actually an array of actors in that way. So uh, I'm going to start by creating a new level and I'll just make it a default one. And we're going to create a new blueprint class. Uh, we'll make it an actor because we don't need it to have any inherited functionality at this point. I mean, I can't think of anything we'd need. This is kind of going to be just our root component for our area. So let's call it spawn area. All right, we'll dunk that into our level because when I do these, I generally forget to put it in the scene and go, why isn't that thing working? Okay, so let's do the first thing and let's add a collider. This is going to determine the volume within which we want to spawn things. So uh, in this case, I'm going to make it a box collision. And let's call this spawn area. Okay, so uh, the first thing I'd like to do is set it up so that we can modify this uh, in the construction script a little bit. So right now you can see that our box is quite small. Um, what we're going to do, uh, I'll just rename that back to spawn. Uh, whatever, a porn area, that's fine. In our construction script, we're going to take this and we're going to access a piece of functionality on a box collider called set box extent. Okay, so we can do that. And what we're going to do is drag off from this one here and promote that to a variable. And let's call that area uh, extents. And we'll make sure that that's public uh, and visible. And if we want that little green thing to go away, we can give it a little bit of a tool tip here. So set the area in which to spawn your objects or actors. Okay, cool, sweet. Uh, now, if we compile this now and have a look at it, we're gonna see that our box has disappeared. And that's because the default value for this, which is setting the box extents, is not very big. So we'll set it to something like, oh, Unreal goes in whole numbers. So we'll do 50 by 50 by 50. Compile that and save it, boom. And we get our box back. But when we go and start changing these numbers here, we can modify the scale of that, which is nice and good. So we'll set it to be a relatively decent sized area. The next thing I wanna kind of get a notion of is the number of things that we want to spawn. Um, we're going to do the same kind of thing where we make this public and we're allowed to, uh, we give ourselves the ability to set that number. So we'll create a new variable and we'll call it num objects, let's say. And um, we'll change that variable type to an integer because we don't want a float. Those will be um, decimal numbers. So we don't want 1.5 objects, we want a whole number. Um, once we've done that, Let's, sh let's have a look at how we're actually going to use this number of objects. So we'll make that public and we'll drag it out here. We'll get it. So whatever we set this to, we'll hit compile and let's set a default of 10 for that value. We're going to be able to override this in the inspector here. We can change that number there. We'll set it to 15 where it says 10 in here. That's fine. And we will do a for loop. This means that whatever piece of functionality we have happen after this loop body is going to run this number of times. Now, right now it's connected to the first index, so we actually want to move that. So we'll hold control and drag that output down into last index. So we're going to start at zero and count up in this case 10 times. It's going to run over this thing. Now the funny thing with integers is because it's base zero, we might end up actually with 11 objects in there. So um, we won't worry about that for the moment, but you know, you could get around that by adding one to that. So start at one, then two, then three, then four, then five, then six, blah, 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 blah. but I'll leave it at zero for now. So we'll, we'll address that later on. And all the stuff to do with actually adding our object, uh, it could be an instance of a class of object. Um, we could add child actors to this one. Uh, in the construction script, it doesn't actually allow us to spawn an actor in the traditional sense. So anything that we wanted to make that had functionality would need to be a child of this object. Um, so that's one thing to, to keep in mind. Now, going back to our box extents, let's 
set the uh, 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 all right let's add a static mesh component so actually let's add an instanced static mesh component um, the reason that we would use an instant static mesh is because it's a lot more efficient um, the mesh itself only takes up one sort of chunk of memory uh, and every instance after that takes up considerably less um, there is still a slight impact, but it's just the efficient way to do it. Instead of going add a static mesh component every single time, we can add instances. So let's pick a static mesh for that, and we'll just call it, I don't know, let's go, I don't know, one meter cube chamfer. Why not? That's kind of cool. That's a funky object. And then we want to... Actually, let's just jump straight down here, and let's grab our source mesh... And when we drag off of that, we can type instance, and we can add instance world space. We can add instance. Um, now, this instance transform is going to be relative to the object that it's being spawned from. So if I plug this straight in here, I split this out and compile it. That should be okay. We'll do that. We'll hit compile and save. And what we should see here is that there are actually... 10 or possibly 11 of these static meshes in that location. So we'll make a random, uh, hang on, random, random unit vector. Uh, we'll compile that, we'll see what that does. Nope, that's not right. I actually want to make a vector. So I want to make, make a vector, and then I actually want to have random numbers coming off of this. So random float in range. Now we could use random floating range, but we'll use random floating range from stream. That means that if we were to move this object around, the construction script would run again, which means that it would kind of create a bunch of new random numbers for everything that had already happened. By having a stream, and we drag off of that and promote it to a variable, and we'll call this stream, we can adjust this number to change essentially the random output of everything, but it will stay consistent. It will use a specific set of numbers as the root for that random distribution. So it is random and we can change it, but it will remember the randomness when we go to do it. So let's say the minimum is gonna be, I don't know, 10 and the maximum is 350. And we will uh, copy and paste that for each of the uh, elements of our vector that we wanna use. Hook those into the stream and plug those in there and there and now for each of the numbers here it's going to go through at an instance at a random location within this range so let's see what happens there aha so we've got our objects happening uh, and if i jump back and i make the stream public i'll just demonstrate that here we can expand it out and as we change that number it's modifying the randomness of that uh, that distribution. But if we move the entire object around, uh, they're staying consistent. Whereas if I had not used that stream, they would be doing this effect every single time I moved the object. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that they all seem to be in the front upper right-hand side of the area. They're not bound by the extent. We'll get to that in a little while. Um, what I want to point out is that that's to do with the numbers that I used. So every time it goes to make this new position to offset the instance from the root of the object, this default scene root, it's only using positive numbers. And if we know about our coordinate systems, this is positive in the X going this way, this is positive in the Y going to the right hand side, and positive Z will be straight up, which makes sense. It's only using positive values. So we can get around that in our range by typing negative 350, negative 350, and negative 350. Okay. Great, cool, compile that, save it, bam. And now they're being distributed uh, around in that area. Now we're not using the box extent right now. So what we probably wanna do is we can get the box extent. Okay, get box extent. And then we will right click and choose split struct pin. So we can use each of these in a way that we want. So box extent X 
will go into the maximum. So whatever the extent of the box in the x-axis is, that will be our maximum value. So we can drive that from this, this, uh, this area extents variable. So all the positive ones are going to go into the max extents. All right, we'll plug that in there. But what we need to do is take that number from, say, box extent y and multiply that by another float, which is going to be negative 1. So, if this was 200 coming out of x, it'll be multiplied by negative 1, which means it'll be negative 200, which is exactly what we want to happen when we're plugging into those min values. So I'll just copy those out, plug each of those in. I think I've done that the wrong way around, but that's okay. Z, and we'll plug that one into the min of that one and that one into that one. So it's, it's starting to get a little bit nesty now. Um, I know it might be a little hard to view, but I think you get the picture. We're going to take whatever the extent of the box is, plug that into the maximum. So an object will only spawn as far away as the box extents, as the air, as the box extents that we set from the area uh, in the construction script, and then it's going to do everything else that we told it to. So if I go back here, boom. Now it's using the center of the objects that it's spawning to determine its location. So they will poke out a little bit from either side, but generally speaking, if I change the area extents, you'll see they move out, they space out, they do cool stuff like that, and we can change the height as well. It's not checking for any intersections or anything like that. Uh, and these are instanced meshes, so they are relatively cheap to do. So if you wanted to create something like an asteroid field or something like that that was just in the backdrop, this would be a cool way to do it. You can see that they all inherit the transform of the root component, so you can grab them, move them around, and do whatever you like with them. Um, and why don't we get a little cheeky with it, okay? We've added our instances. Uh, maybe we'll try uh, changing the number. So actually, another thing that I'll point out is that you can see that as I change the area extents, all of their positions aren't necessarily changing. They're actually scaling with the extents of the box. And that's because the stream is having that effect. Uh, and that's giving us a lot of nice control over it. So I'll bring it back down in size a little bit. And maybe I'll change this to something like 64. So now there are considerably more objects in there filling out the space and everything is awesome. All right, so we've done that. Now let's say that we want to muck around with the rotation a little bit. That's going to be pretty much the same deal. We'll go make rot, make rotator, and then we'll go through and do the same random uh, random float that we want uh, from stream. So we'll drag off of this one and go random, ah, I can't type today, random float in range from stream. Plug that in there. Let's say negative 45 and 45. So this time, it's actually rotation rather than position. So we need to think in terms of degrees. How far do we want each object to potentially be offset from the other one? And we can use the same string. We could drag straight off of this one and use that, meaning that when we change that, they all kind of stay the same. Or we can drag it back in from here and drop it straight onto stream. So it's still calling the same variable for that thing there. All right, and we'll paste it in a couple more times. I'll clean it up a little bit. Bam, Y. And Z, compile that, save it, boom. Now they're all at weird random rotations at a maximum of kind of 45. Now, another thing that we could do in order to have even more control over this would be to kind of do the same thing. We're here, we're plugging in the box extents from the spawn area uh, collider to do the multiply by negative one and get the min and max for that area. We can actually do the same thing uh, here. So let's drag off of max here and we'll promote it to a variable. Let's call it max rot. So that's the maximum rotation that we will allow this to deviate from, uh, the, the amount of randomness that we want in it. And then we can drag off of that, multiply that by another float, which unsurprisingly is negative one. And we'll donk that one in there and we'll grab that, copy and paste it down here. I'm not doing clean blueprinting. Uh, so that's going to be in the min, and the normal one goes into the max. And we'll do that one more time. The negative one goes in there, and the maximum rotation goes in there. Compile, save. Now we'll change this max rot to be public. 
All right. And see, as I increase that number, if I set that to zero, they'll all be uniform. But as I increase it, you'll see they start to all rotate in their random directions, which is very nice. We could also do the same thing with the scale here. So I'll drag this out a little bit here. Let's comment this up and we'll say that this is a random rotation rotation on mesh instance. And this one, we can get that back over there. We can put that up there. Then we'll grab all of this stuff, comment that, and call it random position based on uh, box extents. Cool. All right. So for scale, let's go uh, random. No, I'll still split it. But the difference here is that we want them to be uniform. Random integer, uh, random float in range from stream. Okay, actually, we could probably do. We could probably set up a condition where we can tell it whether we want them to be scaled uniformly. But let's just say that you've got a minimum of 0.25 and a maximum of three. The stream that we're going to plug in is that one, and we'll drag that out and actually plug it into each of them so that the squares remain squares. Compile, save. And now we look, and they're all different sizes as well. It's kind of chaotic. It's kind of crazy. But that is a really simple way to create a configurable area in which to perform some operation. In this case, it was to add an instance for, a, for an instanced static mesh. So I can just go in and change this to be the projectile mesh. Save that. And now it's all those spheres that are floating in the air. So you can see that there's kind of a, a bit of a utility there. Um, let's actually promote these to variables off the scale. We'll call this min, min scale, make it public. We'll drag off of here and make it promote to variable, make it max scale. Because depending on the mesh you might be plugging in, you might want to change it. We'll compile and save that. And then we can, oh, I didn't make that last one public. Compile and save that one again. And maximum scale, let's set that to one. So they're all kind of spaced out. And we could probably 0 0.05 for that one. So it's going to randomly distribute the scale across all of those things. So it's kind of like a weird planetary system. Now these are just passive objects. These are, you know, static meshes. Uh, I don't think they have collision. I'm not sure about collision on instant static meshes. I think you can do it, but you might actually have to be... Yeah, I don't know. I think it's... Someone did something janky with the foliage system and managed to make that stuff work where you could knock trees down using the instant static mesh. It might be that hierarchical stuff. Anyway, that's not important to you. Um, this is how we make a field. And obviously, the uh, this process is for a box. If you wanted to use a sphere you would simply get the radius of the sphere that you had set uh, in here. Uh, the spawn area would be a sphere collision instead of a box, which can be kind of handy as well. Um, changing the number of objects that get spawned. What else might you want to do? Um, well, obviously, what you might like to do is have these be active in some way. You might want to have, I don't know, a field full of, you know, uh, perhaps destructible objects or actual actors themselves that might have some kind of functionality on them. Maybe they shoot at stuff. Maybe they're, you know, um, maybe they have sound emitters on them. You know, all kinds of crazy stuff. That's what we'll get to in the next part where we will be adding child actors to our zone that can have their own functionality. So hopefully that's been interesting. Uh, I'm going to stop this now. Peace out. Cheers.